Hey everybody, this is yet another episode of Sasquatchers. As always, this is Andrew and John, and tonight we are being joined by Dr. Rita Luis. She is a gifted empath, and um, before I completely butcher trying to read all of her accolades, I'm just going to go ahead and let her finish the introduction and tell us a little bit about herself and what she does. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate the invite and bring value to you and your listeners. So, I mean, my story is, is that when I was young, I wanted to become psychic. There were TV shows, The Amazing Crescent, who's still doing it, and a different show called The Sixth Sense, where they had ESP. And I wanted to have ESP. And I spent a lot of years reading books on like the chakras and astrology and numerology. And, and I knew I had some kind of gift, but never really owned it. And then I went to the Berkeley Psychic Institute and studied with them. And after being in their program for three weeks, I came to the realization that I had been very psychic my whole life, but no one ever connected the dots for me. So once I finished the Uh, studying with them, I started a private practice. I would read to the psychic chick where I would talk to you about anything, ended up going back to school and getting a degree as a naturopath, which is a holistic physician, and then a PhD in natural health counseling. And so that's my day job. And then there's the stuff that I do because it's fun, you know, do it going ghost hunting, even though I'm afraid of ghosts, but not afraid of ghosts, afraid of the dark. Um, writing books on ancient mysteries and ancient aliens and relationship stuff, you know, whatever really is floating my boat in that moment that I want to research, I research. And so people are like, God, you talk about all kinds of different things. And it's like, well, I talk about things that interest me. You can only read about chakras and you can only read about certain things for so long before you've kind of read everything there is, or there's really not a very different opinion being made by anyone, you know, because you're at PhD level and, you know, you find these books and they're beginner and it's like, well, why read it? (laughs) So I move on to a new topic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When I was doing show prep for this episode, I almost became overwhelmed with just, how much was covered with your umbrella as far as like, you know, the areas that you talked about and, you know, it seemed to be quite a, an informed expert in. So I was almost, almost nervous about, you know, what, how do I pick this topic or how do I pick that topic? So uh, I'm glad that you brought some of those topics up because we have had past guests on over the last couple of weeks that we've had, ghost hunting investigators who have given us some knowledge. And I would really like to get your take on that subject because um, you're coming at it from a slightly different angle. So um, we can jump into that, but let's start at the beginning. How did you, I mean, you wanted to be psychic, you said, but what brought you to that conclusion? And, you know, how did you, reach it. I mean, I was 12, you know, <laughs> when, so it was, a, so my original thing was I wanted to be an archeologist. And okay. then in eighth grade, we had to do a year long term paper about our career thing, you know? And so there were all like these nurses and teachers and, and I wanted to be an archeologist. And you had to like reach out to schools, you know, to find out what the educational requirement was. And it said, well, you had to have a PhD if you really wanted to do anything. And so that kind of put a nix on that, even though I have a PhD now. Um, And I just became fascinated with, you know, the whole concept of psychic abilities and ESP and that whole thing. And 
um, I don't know, it stuck. You know, I mean, that's a huge, it's a huge area, you know, from studying the Tarot or studying astrology or studying, you know, the more arcane methods of divination to just being able to do a very straight psychic reading. But again, it wasn't until I went to the Berkeley Psychic Institute that I discovered that some of the things that had happened to me that I wrote off as being a coincidence or just a weird anomaly thing happening um, was actually me being very psychic. Do you, you think story? because... <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, you know, so oh, this do you was, think? <laughs> no, so this was before I was psychic and I was in my early 20s and I worked at Memorex and they made, see, I totally date myself with some of these stories and they made five and a quarter floppy disk drives. So that okay, really I dates. I, 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 I vaguely remember those. I was around for You're the tail like, end of it. Yeah, those. I see you in a museum somewhere. <laughs> um, and so I worked as a drafter designer person and in the room next to me was a lab. And so there was a guy who was about my age and we were kind of hellions because <laughs> we were the only young people there. And, um, and so his manager, you know, so I would go in there, say hi, you know, torment them for a while, but I really didn't interact with the manager. And I have to put a caveat on this because I tell this story from a 20 year old's perspective. And so one day the manager wasn't there, which, you know, whatever. And then the following day, you know, he was there and I walk into the lab and, you know, I went to go say hi. And he had like this heavy comb over thing happening. And he had a little round bandaid on the top of his head. You know, so people that know me better know that I have kind of like a weird, distorted visual mind. And so I'm thinking, you know, he had a zit up there and it turned pussy and it was just kind of nasty. So he put the bandaid up there because it was better than having this big red pussy thing. That's what I thought. And I walked up to him. I crossed my arms. I looked at him in the face and said, well, where were you yesterday? Having them check for a brain tumor? And his face turned white and he walked out of the room. And sure enough, that's where he was the day before, was having them check for a brain tumor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but okay. I never correlated like that was a psychic thing. Yeah, no, that was... Would, did, did he ever like ask why, how you came to that conclusion so quickly? Or? So the friend of mine, his assist, lab assistant came screaming at me, screaming. He goes, he thinks I told. So apparently the lab assistant knew and uh, the manager thought the lab assistant, my friend told me, and that's how I found out. But no, it just went whoop, out of my mouth. Wow. Oopsie, <laughs> oopsie. Do you think, um your desire to become psychic at such a young age was maybe a representation of those abilities kind of maybe speaking out to you and you just had to harness it and didn't quite realize it by that point? Or do you think it was strictly an ability that you obtained uh, through your desire to have it? Well, I think that <clears throat> the ability was always there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that the ability was always there. And I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I've never really looked at it from that perspective. Um, you know, but I spent years studying before I found the Berkeley Psychic Institute and studied with them, you know, and I didn't really feel like I was any more psychic. You know, I, I teach classes on psychic development in the Institute of Applied Energetics. And one of the things that I share with my students is my job isn't to teach you how to be psychic, you know, because you have a gift. Being psychic is like dancing. You can either dance really good or maybe not so much, or you can do artwork really good 
or maybe not so much. And you can take classes and maybe get better, you know, or become proficient, but it's still kind of based on your own personal skill set. But what I can do is create situations so that you can recognize your own psychicness. Did that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I was, I, I might have looked confused because I was trying to almost, you know, identify that kind of within myself for a second. I always try to put myself in the, into the, the other side of this conversation. And um, anyway, sometimes it's been easier with some of the other guests. I have like a deep seated uh, interest in this, but it almost, it, it's a, a subject that's large and can sometimes be vague. So um, I picked up a book a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't even anything other than I thought that the cover looked interesting. So I, you know, I picked it up and I haven't gotten into it yet, but it's about birthing and understanding one's psychic abilities. So with the way, the way that you worded that interested me because, you know, I'm a terrible dancer and, you know, I'm okay at art. You know, I did this logo right here, but I don't mm-hmm. think I'm particularly talented in that regard either. So when you said that, I was just kind of thinking, well, maybe, maybe there's a chance, maybe there's some hope for me. Maybe I I can't bust a move on the dance floor because I'm actually, I'm dancing in my brain as a psychic, you know? Mm -hmm. So you kind of, you know, I don't want to say caught me there, but. You know, to me, it's just about really raising your awareness to when you're having that experience. So as an example, when my kids were, I have two step kids. And so when they were growing up, they would come home and go, wow, I had this really weird coincidence at school. You know, I thought we were, I had this thought that we were going to have a test in math class and we did. And I would just stop them. I'm like, that's not a coincidence. You had a psychic experience, you know? And so when you come to recognize that if I think this, or if I feel this, or if I get this imagery or whatever your channel is, you know, and then it happens. That is the psychic experience, you know. So, so how, how do we? Do- oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was. How do we delineate between like a coincidence and a psychic experience? Like, how does one discern um, between? If you, you have know- the information pre the situation happening, it's a psychic experience. Okay. I was going to ask that question as well. Because so I'm going to give a very mundane example, very mundane. So you get up in the morning and you're getting ready for work, whatever. And this thought crosses your mind. Well, maybe I should take a sweater or maybe I should take an umbrella, but you think to yourself, it's a beautiful day and the sun is out. You know, what do I need that stuff for? And so you don't. And then you get to work and the air conditioner is down at 60 degrees or You know, some storm rolls through and you sit there and you're like, oh, man, I should have brought that sweater. Oh, man, I should have brought that umbrella. So you were receiving the information, take a sweater, take an umbrella. Now, granted, you didn't listen to yourself, which is okay, but you received it. And so people that I know that I'm working with, it's like, recognize those moments that you're getting information and whether you act on it or not is less important than recognizing that you got it, that you received it. Because after a certain amount of time, you're going to go, you know, every time I get that little voice in my head or I see this image, you know, like of a sweater or whatever, it always comes true. And it's always something that's beneficial in my life. So I think I'm going to listen to it this time versus ignore it. How how do you go from, um, you know, getting that intuition about needing a sweater to, you know, maintaining that intuition so that like, you know, maybe that occurred a couple of times and there's something there. How do you build upon that so that you know the next time that you're going to need that sweater or umbrella or the time after that or the time after that. 
I mean, you know, it becomes trial and error and, and it becomes a practice where you just go, okay, <laughs> I, you know, I got this and, you know, I can listen to it or I can ignore it. And there's, there are times where I find myself doing some of the weirdest things because I get this little, you know, insight and so I just, you know, now I just automatically do it, you know, and then there, there, but for, even for me, there are still times where I'll get that little insight and it's like, nah, 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 you know, I don't really feel like doing that. Like you should get the pot holder, you know, because that pot's going to be hot and you're like, nah, I just put it on the stove, but it's like burning freaking hot. It's like, I mean... I challenge anybody listening, you know, maybe not in this moment, but to just take a moment to kind of look at your own life for those situations where you have this feeling or whatever that you should act in a certain way and you did it. And you, you know, I don't want to say you paid the price, but you kind of paid the price. Interesting. Yeah. Like the, when, you're in a car and you don't have your seatbelt on yet and you get that kind of like sudden not not because you're supposed to have a seatbelt on but like suddenly you just kind of feel like I, I should probably get that on you know that that happened well at least it used to happen to me a lot before I made that you know change in my life to always have that seatbelt on after being destroyed by a Mack truck but um that would happen to me a lot and you know that's I guess, I don't know, my kind of example of that. But, you know, I don't think I'm psychic or anything. So it could just have been that well, fear. You know, of I mean, fear can play a part in it. Um, my belief is that we all have psychic abilities. You know, we're just not told that we do. Um, you know, and I, I get this question a lot that people want to like develop their psychic abilities because they think that they'll know the future, you know, and they can use it to like, you know, and I don't want to say navigate their life, but because they can use it to navigate their life, you know, but to like heal their trauma and look at themselves and get all of these insights. And it is very, very different for me to give somebody a reading versus me being clear enough inside to listen to myself. We're all good at going into denial and not listening to stuff or talking, talking ourselves out of something. I have another story, another good story. So, I mean, this was a number of years ago. Well, actually a lot of years ago and, um, the whole life expo. So they were a, big metaphysical event, you know, and I had gone to the one, I lived in Seattle, so I would go to it there. I had gone to Atlanta to a, to a show there, but big show, big show. And they came to Texas one year and were in Austin and it was huge. I didn't get out of my chair for three days. I mean, there were like 22,000 people there. I so they were going to, yeah, it was huge. So they were coming back and they were doing the event in Dallas. Now, Austin, geographically speaking, has three major cities that can feed into it, which I was like, you know, that made a lot of sense where Dallas is kind of, you know, not in this cluster of major cities. And so I don't, my feeling, my feeling was, well, you know, it's whole life expo. You can stay at home. You don't have to get a hotel room. And in my mind, I am justifying why I should get a booth, a very expensive booth at whole life expo. But there was this part of me that kept going. And I was finally, I was like, you know, Rita, if you were doing a reading for yourself on whether you should go to it, it's like, you're just not feeling it. You're just not feeling it. So ultimately, I didn't go. Then the airplane struck the towers in New York City and Whole Life Expo in Dallas did not happen because, well, it happened, but none of their speakers showed up because they couldn't fly anybody in. 
Wow. That that's serious intuition. That is that's but it's heavy. really but it's about listening to yourself. Does this feel good to me? Does this feel right? Or am I talking myself into it? And when we read for ourselves, we are so good at talking ourselves into stuff that we don't want to do or not doing stuff that we should do. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's almost hard to follow already. Um, (laughs) You had said earlier about, you know, some people have that misconception about, you know, like, you're just able to sit there and read the future. So one thing that I I wanted to ask before you hit us with that um, was, (laughs) it's good. That's, that's why you're here. That stories like that. That's incredible. Um, How do you deal with those misconceptions and which misconceptions, you know, kind of irk you the most? Well, I mean, I don't deal with the misconceptions, you know, the, narrative that is often put out there is you need to open up your chakras, you know, so you need to like listen to this music to open up your six chakras so you can see. And it's like, yeah, whatever. (laughs) If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to focus more on what's going on inside of me, you know, which will naturally open up channels. You know, because the focus is inside versus doing these external things with the goal of having something happen, which usually makes it not happen. Right, right, right. So what you're so what you're really focusing on is not not this external mysticism, but really what's what's kind of indwelled already inside of yourself or somebody else. Correct. You know, and again, when you're doing a reading for somebody else, it's like, so there's our auric field, which is the electromagnetic field around our body and then our, which our aura, and then there are our chakras and our energy and whatever. And so we are like a walking billboard of our stuff, but I'm not in your aura. I am external to it. So I can look at it from a very objective place. But when you're in your body, you are in the midst of your programming. You're in the midst of your, you know, previous trauma. You are in the midst of societal programming, you know, so you have to sit there and kind of sort through all of your own crap to move that out of the way, to be neutral, to going, okay, this is what I got and I'm going to act on it. I mean, I think everyone has had the situation where they're in a relationship and on some level they know that like they need to go (laughs) and it needs to end, but they just, you know, they lie to themselves. It's like, no, you know, it'll be okay. You know, and you, but you're not really being honest with yourself, you know, and probably if you asked yourself, you know, should I stay in this relationship? The answer you would get is no. Right. Yeah. I actually, um, it wasn't like a romantic relationship or anything, but I've recently come out of what I thought was a pretty toxic, uh, relationship and friendship with some, um, oh boy. <laughs> we'll get super into it, just relating to the subject. Um, and you know, I, what you're describing is exactly how I felt for the longest time when it was like, you know, this is almost suffocating and strangling you know like we're just vampires to each other we're like why are why are we still you know hanging out and talking the way that we do all the time and uh since we kind of parted ways because you know all parties involved kind of felt it um this there's like a a weight has been lifted like i'm i stand taller and mm-hmm. I don't know if it, it has something to do with, you know, maybe something going on with like the aura, aura or the auric, um, what did you just auric boundary is what you called it? Um, the auric field. Field. Well, you field. Know, when you're interacting with someone who, you know, I don't want to say that they're negative, that brings down your energy, you know, and interferes with you being you. And if you find that you are, I like to call it bad brain, 
You know, if you're, you're running around and you have bad brain and every time you interact with this person, you go into this negative place or you feel like you've been, you know, your energy has been sucked out of you or, you know, whatever, it's kind of like, there's a part of us that's like, why am I doing this? You know, this person not, you know, there's always that little narrative going on inside, but we don't listen to it. You know, and I think if I say anything, that's the part that needs to be listened to, because if it's telling you what, what the heck are you doing? Then maybe you need to listen to that and take a step back and go, what am I doing? You know, I mean, because right. that's spirit or your guides or your higher self or whatever, trying to get your attention. And that's a psychic thing. Somebody's talking to you. <laughs> and then it just kind of becomes a matter of like, you know, when do you actually start to listen? Um, I'm curious, uh, just because you were mentioning, like you said, like Seattle, and then we're talking about Dallas and all this all these other you know, places. Is there, in your experience, any where that is maybe geographically better for uh, your abilities? Uh, like, okay, for instance- interesting. No, I, I know where you're going. You know, so there okay. are people, and this, is, this isn't my area, but I can like kind of talk on it generically, you know, that do something called astrocartography. And they look at your birth chart and then they map it on the earth. And so based on like the relationship between your planets and different geographic locations can tell you like, well, this would be a good spot for you. Or if you went here, these are the kinds of challenges or this would be enhanced, whatever. Um, Texas has been a little bit hard. You know, it's a Bible Belt state. But by the time I moved to Texas, I already had kind of a national presence. So it was okay. Um, Washington, Washington was the most interesting. I lived in California too, and I'm from New York. So, I mean, I have a lot of, Washington, I think was the most interesting um, because doing psychic work, doing energy healing, anything in that realm was pretty much accepted by the general public. So Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer, is like the primary employer in the Seattle area. And so Boeing had clubs, you know, like the AV club and the chess club and this club. And one of their clubs was a parapsychology club. And in order to fund the club, the club had psychic fairs twice a year. And, you know, and the fair went out in the company newsletter, you know, and so it made psychic stuff be okay in the whole Boeing culture, which was most of Seattle. And so I tell people, you know, I, I came out of the psychic closet in Seattle because it, there was no shame, you know, there wasn't anything to hide because if you said, Oh yeah, I do psychic reading. It's like, oh yeah, you know, my neighbor does is a Reiki master. You know, it's like because it was just so common in that area. I've noticed that, and I don't even think that's just um, just generalized in in with the psychic field either. I I, th I think that area, at least in the packs that I've ran with, tends to kind of be that way for a lot of different. Um, mm -hmm things of in the paranormal uh alternative thought ideas yes exactly. yeah that's a, a way better more elegant way of saying it um you know so but i think we, we, base of it, i mean because i haven't lived in seattle in forever you know but i think the base of it was it opened the door to being able to talk about things that were at the time very taboo um, and have it be okay. You think that has anything to do with the weather there? Uh, you know, like <laughs> you guys have like all the rain and the kind of birth grunge music and stuff. You, like, is that maybe a geo, like a geographical thing that? I don't um, know. I only lasted four <laughs> years and then I had to go. It was too cold, <laughs> too wet, and too dark for me. I had to go back to a sunshine state. <laughs> 
So to touch on one of our guests that we just had on, Father Vincent Lampert, if, and if, if he were on right now, um, he's very charitable and, and very kind. But I think I think his opinion would be not to dabble in this stuff um, in the psychic realm and things like that. Now, not a direct answer to him, but let's say, you know, somebody that would be Catholic or Christian or Muslim or whatever it might be that kind of, you know, sways away from these kind of things. What would you say to these people? To, to invite them in to kind of, you know, open their minds and have them take a look at this kind of alternative methods. I probably wouldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, you know, but I would open up the conversation to what we were talking about. Well, haven't you had this experience? You know, and how would you identify that? You know, and you Okay. So, I mean, I live in Texas, you know, I have a lot of friends that are Christians. So there's been a lot of conversations that have happened, you know? And so while I might say, you know, psychic, they might say, oh, well, you know, that was the Holy Spirit talking to me, you know? And I don't know. So it's just maybe even. there's There's just a lot of semantics that go on. And it's whether they can step above their vocabulary. Because really, if you sit there and talk about, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, speaking tongues or, you know, whatever, you know, having Jesus come talk to you or whatever, it's like, it's the same, except we use different words to talk about the same experience because it is a human experience. And if you can let go of your words and look at the experience of it, then you could maybe own it, but they can't usually, at least that's been my experience. So just maybe even just like how one allows themselves to interpret what's Mm -hmm. happening. Um, Mm -hmm. But so I'm glad he brought that episode up because that episode dealt with exorcisms specifically. Um, and I watched a, you know, a good bit of the videos that you have on your, on your channel on YouTube, which I will link to because uh, I want anyone who listens to this to go check it out because there's just so much interesting stuff on there. But you had well, a series more stuff on my webpage. Yeah, yeah. There's like three or four different links that I I had open the last couple of days on my browser. I was just trying to absorb as much as possible. But the one thing that like really jumped out uh, was attached en- entities. And uh, if you're cool talking about that, I wanted to you know, get into that a little bit, just because I was fascinated with the videos that you had uploaded, but it also is a good callback to that episode that we had a couple of weeks ago because, um, you know, interpretations being what they are, it could be, you get, you could have been dealing with similar things that he may have been dealing with. Oh, they're, they're the exact same thing, but it's just different words. Uh Right. You know, um, you know, so my experience has been, well, let me just kind of back up. So this is my definition of an attached entity. So an attached entity is the uh, presence of, you know, and in the majority of the time, a non-corporeal being, so a human being, dead, invisible human being that enters our auric field, which is the energy field around our body and tries to manipulate and control what's going on inside of you. You know, whether it's like talking to you bad or making you feel bad, you know, but there's always a negative connotation. And, you know, and I have to caveat that with when things are inside of our auric field, we assume it's us because our auric field is us. And so when they enter the auric field, we, you know, Many times we assume, well, if I'm having these thoughts, they're my thoughts. You know, if I'm having these feelings, they're my feelings. You know, where if they're outside our auric field, we can make that separation. 
um, many times attached entity, you know, so an attached entity is not necessarily, is not a ghost. It doesn't take up residence in a location, you know, so there is, you know, it's connected to a person, it's connected to an individual and depending on, you know, they have to be invited in, you know, so I have a lot of people that go, Oh, well, you know, uh, I went to this cemetery and now I have an entity attached, but I'm like, eh, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's kind of like the black eye kid children, you know, you have to invite them in, you know, and then they attach to you and they attach to some negative vibration, negative energy that you're carrying around your negative thought patterns, you know, and so I've done a lot of spirit release work with people over the years, you know, and I, a lot. I get a lot of calls from people. It's like, well, I've spent thousands of dollars and, you know, they, they get rid of the entity, but then it comes back. But the dynamic is they moved the entity out of their auric field, which allowed them to raise their personal vibration. And they're able to hold that personal vibration to a certain state. But then something happens. I'm sorry, my dog is going crazy. No, that's room. okay. That's good. But then something happens that triggers them, that lowers their vibration into that same negative triggered pattern that they had before. And the entity comes back because now their defenses are down. And until they raise their vibration again, they're going to have that entity kind of lurking. How's that? You, you know what's interesting? What you just said, there's some methodology that's a little bit different and some some hermeneutics and some words that are different, but that's pretty much what Father Lampert said a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> you know, from a different standpoint, obviously. But what you just communicated to us is pretty much what he communicated just from a different, you know, basis. Well, you know, there, there is a phenomena and the phenomena is very consistent. And so you could put whatever words you want on it, um, but it's still the same thing, you know, and I've only had two clients that I would say were full blown, like possessed people. Okay, one was a client that I referred because she had this nasty entity attached to her that was kind of beyond my skill set. So I have a really good friend who's a demonologist. And I'm like, Mike, I'm sending her to you. And he was just really busy, apparently. You know, so I give her the number. And um, I don't know, a few weeks later, I was out shopping. My phone rings. I answered the phone. She was like, he didn't call me back. And I'm like, holy crap. Because this woman was so afraid and had this very soft voice. She sounded like a grandmother. And the person that called, I'm like, I'll call Mike and have him get a hold of you. And I hang up and I call Mike and I'm like, her entity just called me. I mean, it was just like creepy. Wow. Creepy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how I would respond to that kind of phone call. Well, Should have called Father I mean, Lampert. <laughs> well, it was just kind of like, okay. I mean, I've never had that happen before where the entity actually called me. You know, I mean, usually, you know, a person has an entity attachment and the person makes the appointment and then they cancel because the entity doesn't want them to have the appointment. That's usually what happens. Um, not that the entity is pissed off. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, the entity called. <laughs> Do you think that that was the the entity? Um, I don't know, posturizing, like you know, almost kind of trying to stir the pot and demonstrate how strong it was, or is maybe did that thing regret attaching and also want out? No, my feeling was that, that entity had climbed all the way into her body. You know, because a lot of the times the entity just kind of like hangs out in your auric field and they might like stand right behind you or to the side. And I've only had a couple of cases where they actually 
did a full blown possession. And she was one of them. That entity was in her body and took it over, which is how the entity could call because it was not her voice at all. All. That just gave me goosebumps. Um, I'm curious. uh, You said that. I'm doing a, my show. I'm doing ghost stories and I'm doing a conference and I'm going to be talking ghost stories, but see, that would be a good one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a good one. Um, you had said that, you know, this could only happen due to invitation. Um, so I'm curious, is there a way to do this by accident? Can you invite something and not um, you realize that you've done it or do you have to have completely that's usually what happens? No, that's usually what happens is you accidentally invite it in, you know? So the most common, uh, individuals that end up with entity attachments, sorry, I'm making a note about that story that have entity attachments are little kids, you know, that are brought up in traumatic households because they're asking for someone to come save them and who comes but the entity. So that's the most common place. And it's also the most challenging individuals to work with to move it out because they grow up with the entity as being part of their lives and they just assume that that's who they are. Um, okay. Is that, yeah. is that like their, inv- their invisible friend kind of thing? Could be. Could be. Not necessarily, but could be. Um, one of the more common is people that have drug, alcohol, addiction issues where Frank is a really nice guy till he starts drinking and then he becomes a totally different person. And they're the totally different person because they're the person with the entity that's kind of running the show. You know, and so the addictive behavior is how they open the door to let it in. You know, but then I've had clients that did automatic writing, um, you know, did they did channeling and they really didn't know what they were doing and uh, invited in, you know, and people sit there and go, oh, well, you know, if you play with a Ouija board, you're going to end up with all these issues. But I was going to ask that. <laughs> but that's because I was like psychic momenting you. Uh, <laughs> you got me. You got me. 100%. <laughs> But the reality is, is that when the people, you know, I'm going to use the automatic writing, you know, they'll do that, but then they become dependent on it, you know, so they're doing automatic writing and they're communicating with some spirit and the spirit's like giving them all kinds of great information. And now they're asking the spirit for some guidance and they're trusting it and they've just opened the door and let it in. But then over time, the communication starts to change and they start getting a little snipey and, and now they're yelling at you. And so instead of being this bright light, they've manipulated you into becoming this evil thing, which was really who they were in the first place. You know, so it's one thing to like, you know, play around with a Ouija board, you know, I mean, whatever, you know, it's a non-issue. It's another thing to use it because you're getting information from whoever the spirit is and becoming like dependent. I'm not really sure what other word to use for that on this communication with the spirit. Yeah, it's like a co- codependency almost. Mm-hmm. I mean, I well, and, and the automatic writing has seemed to have been the worst. I've had several people that did automatic writing and they would start off with one entity. And I had one lady that had eight, you know, oh, but wow, one entity. Heavy. Well, but she started with the one entity that she did invite in. And then that entity brought other people in and created a vortex in her space. And it was very complicated to deal yeah, with. It sounds complicated. <laughs> How would one differentiate between true um, attachment like that versus, you know, maybe just something going on mentally. So like a schizophrenic person having yeah. people talk to them? Um, yeah, I guess that would, that would make sense. Um, 
or any of the other kind of mental health diagnoses that you that you run into. And I'm sure that there are, you know, on both cases, sometimes misdiagnosis of, you know, this person actually does just have something chemically going on. And this person might actually then have attachments that aren't being addressed because. I mean, usually where you find that is in people that are schizophrenic. You know, that sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I'm talking to people, you know, or these people are talking to me and it's, you know, and you look at them, it's like, yeah, they sure are. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that some people that um, might be psychopaths might have some entity issues, you know, where they have these voices telling them to do stuff, but they're not clinically schizophrenic. You know, so when you start getting into like those really bad ones, but those are the only two that really jump into my mind. I mean, the schizophrenia, um, that's a pretty high probability that there is an entity there, you know, because people that have schizophrenia, when you look at them from a psychic perspective, their chakras, their energy centers, which are supposed to open and close are usually fixed in one position. And so they're not really able to filter information. And so they just receive whatever is there, you know, and that includes things that is normally filtered out by, you know, our cognitive reality. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, Get the dictionary out. Hold on. (laughs) Cognitive reality. (laughs) It is the reality Um, that we all agree upon, you know, because most of reality says that there's no such thing as ghosts. And most of reality says there's no such thing as psychic abilities. Or I just went and did an investigation and there was this kind of what looked like it had been kind of this swampy area. And I'm not like a big like, oh, my God, there's elementals in my backyard. But I'll tell you what, there were elementals on that property. You know. But so what, we, are, what, what are elementals? I don't know. You know, like fairies and, you know, okay. those kind of yep. things. Um, I mean, but it had that energy. It had, you know, and I wasn't really pursuing that because we were looking for the angry drunk man. So <laughs> <laughs> I know where I know where to find him. <laughs> he's, he's actually right there and he's talking to you. <laughs> But, uh, you brought up ghost hunting and I'm actually really fascinated with how that would work with somebody who is um, as connected with the ability as you are uh, because you know you're running a paranormal podcast and everything obviously like I've kind of grew up being a fan of this stuff and interested in it and you know I mean you go all the way back to when taps first showed up on the sci-fi channel you know, I watch all of this stuff. I read all of the books and it tends to be normal people who aren't channeling any type of ability with, you know, now it's spirit boxes and some of the other equipment, but, you know, it used to be, you know, cameras or whatever, but there are the people with the abilities like yourself or, um, the Warrens, um, how does that feel to walk into a haunted environment being that connected uh, with what's going on? Well, you know, depending on where I go, you know, will depend on like my puke factor. Um, (laughs) So So it could be pretty intense. one One of the things that I love about my role is I don't have to buy any equipment I don't have to review any footage. I don't have to do anything. I just have to show up. So that's like, yay. And when I go into an investigation, you know, it's like, you guys go over there and talk about it. And I'm going to go over here. And when you guys are done talking, then I'm going to walk in. Because basically all I want to know is we're at a location. And if we're at a location, it's that there's something going on. You know, or at least according to the owners, there's something going on, you know, and I'll just walk through and I'll sit down and I'll scan the room or scan the property, look at the owners, because sometimes they're the issues. Um, And then, you know, 
sometimes I'll walk through with the group and go, you know, I'm just noticing something here, maybe set up a piece of equipment. So when I was doing my most active ghost hunting, it was before taps. I mean, so, you know, and there really wasn't any equipment other than cameras and video and that kind of thing, you know? So I would be like, you know, do some stuff over here and whatever. And then I'll, make my communication or review to the owner of the property as to this is what I noticed and this is what I felt and, you know, kind of trip them out a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but what a lot, I think a lot of people don't realize is like everybody wants their stuff to be really haunted, but there's so many places that, you know, it's a residual haunting, which means there's not an active spirit there. It's just leftover energy. Or, you know, there's just a bunch of stagnant energy and, you know, it's just stuck. So it feels really heavy, you know, and so you get these sensations from it, but there's not anything going on. Uh, is there anything you could do in that situation to help with that stagnant energy or the residual yeah, stuff? Yeah, tell them that they should clean their house usually. <laughs> is it that simple? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, were you drinking? <laughs> I'm good. Wasn't expecting it, but I'm good. <laughs> I don't understand why things aren't flying off my walls right now. If it's that, <laughs> yeah, I got I got some problems here. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I can understand the residual energy part, but you, you know, like. Stagnant energy, you know, you go into an antique store, you know, and that stuff's been sitting on the shelves for months and months and months and hasn't been moved. And, you know, there's just that feeling, you know, that the energy is just very stagnant, you know, and there's some like very disappointed people because you're like, well, there's really not anything active going on here. And they're like, what do you mean? Whatever. Yeah, it does kind of always seem to be like people that the hardest, most difficult thing that they would have to face is what they want to face at that point. Like to me, I think getting that news would be fantastic. I mean, okay, well now I don't have to, you know, rid my house of this entity or you know fear that we're being you know attached by something. I, that is something that you see like a lot, even on the television shows, which I mean take for a grain of salt everything's so overproduced at this point but that is a narrative that like everybody wants to be you know haunted for some reason i don't i think <laughs> <laughs> you know so on thursday nights i do a dr read live well it's thursday night thursday night live with dr Reed louise available on facebook and youtube and um you know, so inevitably someone will ask me about some dead person, you know? And so like all my little blurpy thing, it's like, please no questions about dead people, you know, because I won't respond to them. And I always, you know, I can always feel they're looking at me like, not that I can see them, you know, like, well, what do you mean? You're a psychic. You should talk to dead people. And it's like, I don't want to talk to dead people. It's like, because if I'm talking to your dead people, that means I have to take your Aunt Sally and have her come to me so I can communicate with her. And I don't want her in my house. It's one thing if I go to your house and I'm talking to Aunt Sally, but she can freaking stay there. I don't want her in my house. And they just. I don't even want my live aunts in my house. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so I said, I don't even want my living aunts in my house. <laughs> Yeah, that. Oh, man. man, I had a follow up, and it's completely out of my brain I dis now. I disrupted the whole thing. <laughs> <No>. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. Oh, okay, so is there is there something you have to do to prevent Aunt Sally from attaching to you when you are there, and then following you home? I mean, I don't personally do anything. You know, I mean, if I feel like I have stuff on me, I just kind of like shoo it off. I've had stuff follow me home, but it'll like hang out for a couple of days and then it just goes, you know, but the amount of locations that actually have an active haunting versus just a residual haunting um, is like 
you know, 90, 10. I mean, there, there's not all that many very active hauntings. I've only experienced a handful of them myself. A lot of residual, but not really active. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a statistic people should be happy to hear because, you know, again, you're not dealing with any of the severe craziness that comes with it. Mm hmm. Um, I don't, with this much time that we've been talking, I don't want to jump around topic, 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 and then, you know, take up too much of your time. But I wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions. Um, do you do tarot readings or have you ever done tarot? And basically... The reason I ask that is because I had a uh, an interest in it. I have a deck. I don't really use them, but I was curious if there is any tr like kind of truth to, um, you know that it, it despite being just like what you talked about the the Ouija board earlier, and you know a lot of people would say, well, that I mean that is a that's a Mattel board game, and you know discredit it. But despite that, this is like a deck of cards that I bought. Is there? an energy to it, you know, should these be treated with respect? Uh, I have it in a, in a box. I have a nice, uh, a velvet bag that I put them in. Uh, I keep them nice. I don't touch them, but I know they're there. Uh, is, is there like something to that, I guess is what I'm asking. So I have some cards that I keep in their box. I have some that I have in a nice box that are wrapped in a silk scarf. And then I have two decks of the same cards that I, I read this deck called Dream Cards, and they're uh, an Oracle deck. They're not uh, a Tarot deck. And, uh, and so one is in my suitcase for when I go to shows and I have a table and I'm set up. And then I have one that's up in my desk. But like when I'm working with clients, I don't ever use the cards. I only use them when I'm at an event because I can crack out a 15 minute reading, just a cold bam reading. And mine live in a Ziploc bag, a really old Ziploc bag that's in this suitcase that lives in my closet. So, you so know, I don't... dealing with cards are different than the Ouija board because the Ouija board, you are asking, you know what I mean? You're, asking for information where the tarot cards you might ask a question but the tarot cards are telling a story you know so it's right. a different level of involvement with the spirit world if that made sense no it does and i'm i'm glad you, you know, clarified those I mean, so basically i guess i i don't have to worry or be concerned that the corner of the box got a little dented in a move once and yeah. like i didn't create like some type of terrible energy uh from doing that you know um, i i guess i'm one of the most like not dogmatic people when it comes to different things you know so there's a lot of stuff that's out there and they're like oh well you need to do this i used to read at this one like smaller psychic fair. And this one guy had to face East because if he didn't face East, it was wrong. Well, the room didn't face East, you know, so he would always be like perpendicular to everybody else, but that was his thing. And it was like, whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm just not that way. <laughs> uh, that's no, that's cool to hear. Um, because you know, no, you're I, I, coming from a pretty, you know, expert opinion. So, you know, I take what you say with a lot of credence. Uh, and again, I don't mean to, uh, well, you're absolutely welcome. Um, I don't mean to jump around here, but, you know, we try not to take too much of your time. But you had a video of, uh, well, discussing Nephilims. And mm -hmm. basically, our show is called Sasquatchers. You know, that's a play on Sasquatch. We don't have nearly enough Sasquatch content. Um, 
I wanted to get your opinion because there's now a growing number of people with the theory that Sasquatch is actually a Nephilim. And since you have um, some knowledge of it, I just wanted to get your take on it real quick. And I would say no, <laughs> not at all. You know, I mean, the Nephilim is, um, without going, I mean, because it's getting late, you know, without going into this whole thing, you know, but it comes from the Greek and it means giant or earthborn, you know, and so there are stories of giants that walk the earth, you know, that you find in cultures around the world. And so that's what that word means is earthborn. You know, and so when you read stories from myth about the giant being born of the or being created from the cast off blood of Uranus, or there was another god who threw knives into the earth and they became the giants, you know, but they were the earth born, um, you know, but not Sasquatches. And, you know, and the giants were, were eliminated in the flood. I mean, that was one of the major things that mm -hmm. the flood did was to get rid of them. Right. Just it's just away. one of those. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're called Sasquatchers, but we've only talked about Sasquatch one time. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Twice, you know. twice now. <laughs> I just, I, for me, as much as, like Sasquatch to me has kind of become like the Jesus fish of the paranormal. Like, uh -huh. It's almost a mascot and you see it everywhere now and, you know, I'm here for it. But I think a, a lot of the theories that, you know, have you know popped up over the last however many years are, almost are grasping for straws a little bit. So since you had that knowledge, I just wanted to ask real quick because you are, you know, you're blunt with your answering, which I, yeah, I love. I help that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good quality you know i prefer that over being talked around for 15 minutes just to get to like no and here's why an answer a non-answer here but it was a lot of <laughs> so, fluff here we gave you a lot of fluff but said nothing it's like okay thanks but buy my book i'll right. tell you all about it <laughs> well on that note i hope well, all of our listeners and future listeners do buy your books um, we'll include all of your links and stuff, but is there anything you want to promote, um, verbally in the meantime? You know, so if anybody would like to schedule a private consultation with me, they can go to my website, website, which is soulhealer.com, um, and just drop me a note, you know, and I would love to invite your listeners um, every Thursday night, seven o'clock central, I do Thursday night live with Dr. Rita Louise. So you can, uh, go to my group page, Dr. Rita live on Facebook. You can go to just energy radio. That was my old podcast, just energy radio on YouTube and access it there. And I just set up rumble, but I'm having, this will be my first week to see if it actually worked or else I'd give that more of a pitch. You know, but people can come. So this week I'm talking about ghost stories. You know, I, I have, I have a topic that I talk about for about 15 minutes and then I open up the chat and people can ask questions about pretty much anything except dead people. <laughs> so. What, yeah. what about almost dead people? Well, you know, every so often a dead person will come through. You know, and what's interesting is if you ask me about a ghost at your house or if you ask me about your attached entity, I'll talk to you about it. But if you ask me about dead Aunt Sally, you know, I'm not, I'm not going there. But every so often, dead Aunt well, Sally turns up in a reading, you know, so can't help. Aunt me. Sally's not dead yet, but Thanksgiving hasn't happened. So I'll talk <laughs> to you that after that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, Dr. Rita Luis, everybody. Again, I want to go ahead and thank you for, for your time. It was an awesome conversation. And, you know, maybe we can do it again sometime. Okay. That sounds great. Right. Thanks, thank guys. So, thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Yep.
Yep. Uh, we always sign off with uh, a saying, so I, I'm sorry if we look silly with it, but <laughs> all right, everybody, thanks for squatching. Sasquatch you later. Cringe.